want to pick up there, and then we're going to move forward to some goodies. Yes, goody stuff. All right, Genesis 2 and 6. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And remember now, God had not caused it to rain because there was no man to till the ground. Which remember, I told you again that there was no man to till the ground. So the, so the opportunity was waiting for this man to get there. There's opportunity is waiting for us all to get there. We talked about the till. How the till was three tills. No, the till is actually longer than until because until has a condition. Till does not have a condition because therefore till is longer than, than until. We also talked about till, T-I-L-L being a man's work. A man's work is his purpose. Then we talked about the T-I-L-L also being the till being a drawer. A drawer where there's cash at hand. So we found that we will continue to till till the till is full. Can't stop, won't stop. All right? So we're going we're gonna to till, till the till is full. Because notice, God gave man work. He didn't give him a job. Too many people are looking for a job and not people looking for work. Work give you purpose. That man had purpose. Remember now, God did not cause it to rain because there was no man to till the ground. So that man had purpose. Somebody say purpose. Everybody got purpose. I don't care how you are. I don't know how to do nothing. Come on, nothing? Like nothing, nothing. You don't have to do nothing? That's the thing we got to find out, and that's what we're going to find out by the time I finish up the next week on 3.0 in the Living Exceptional Life, that every man has purpose. Purpose. God has placed it in every person's heart. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 37, 4 through 5, that if you delight yourself in him, he'll give desires of your heart. Where's the desire? In your heart. What's in your heart? Purpose. A person who finds purpose never gets tired. Never gets tired at all. At least not doing their work. People get tired of their job, but not work. Not work. I know people work from sun up to sundown and love it. Love it. Oh, write this down. Let me give you real quickly three characteristics of the perfect job. Three characteristics of the perfect job. This just hit me real quick. I want to give you three characteristics of the perfect job. Say, how, Pastor, how do I know I got the perfect job? One, this is how you know you got the perfect job, which is why it's number one. One, you love doing it. You love doing it so much, sometimes you do it for absolutely nothing. You do it for free. You love it. I don't care if it's weaving hair, weaving baskets. I don't care what it is. You love doing it. You don't get tired. Yeah, your fingers might hurt and all that, but you love doing it. You love the beauty that you make. Whether it's baskets, whether it's hair, whether it's people, or whether it's uh, uh, grass, uh, uh, or whether it's painting cars or fixing cars or whatever the beauty you add to it. See, purpose puts you in a position of God. Are you with me? One, you love it. You love it so much, you sometimes do it for free. Two, you're good at doing it. I know, I know some people that love to do something. You're like, you know what? You need to, need to look at doing it, find another skill. Because you just ain't, ain't that good at this here. I understand you love doing it. Remember I said three categories of the perfect job. The perfect. So... One, you love doing it, and two, you are good at doing it. Because I know some people who are good at doing something, but say, you know what, this is, this is really not in my heart. This is really not for me. People say, girl, I wish I knew how to do that. Right. But some people just not. Some, some people just don't. They're good at it, but they don't love to do it. Some people love to do it, and not just good at it. And then last but certainly not least, not only do you love to do it, you do it for free. Not only are you good at doing what you do. And three, you get doggone paid well to do it. That's the perfect job. You find those three characteristics, you will never work a day in your life. Matter of fact, truth, truth be told, that is the day you just retired. Why would you quit doing something you love to do, you're good at doing to get paid to do it? Like what I'm doing? Yeah, I'll be doing this or that till I just die. There is no retirement for me. I just throw it over to my kids or whatever the case may be. I would never retire. How could you retire from doing something you love to do which is in your heart? Because once you find out what you love to do, it will pull you no matter what. Even when you... Why do you think older people wind up living longer? Because they got purpose in their life now. The minute you remove their purpose, they gone. They only fish for so long and run to the mall so long and go on a couple of vacations for so long after that. They better find something. Are they gone? They gone. 
But if you find this at whatever age, 18, 28, 38, 48, 58, 60, the minute you found it, you have retired. Watch this, because watch this. Many people retire from their job so they can do what they want to do. But if you're already doing it, what you retiring for? Nobody in the Bible ever retired. And Moses retired after serving God for 120 years. Oh, and Samson retired. If nobody, David retired. Nobody ever retired. They just died because they was already living a life of purpose. That's a good life. No matter how the weather is, cold, hot, rainy, snow, whatever it is, I still jump out, to, out of my bed today excited. No matter what. Because I love what I do. I love what I do. And that's the ideal characteristics of the perfect, the perfect job. All right, so let's get back to this, get back to this mist thing. Let's get back to the mist. Uh, Genesis 2 and 6. Let's pop that back up there. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Notice a mist went up from the earth. It didn't come from no clouds. It came from the earth, which I, I gave you uh, six characteristics of the mist. One is your situation, circumstances, or uh, hidden potential will show up. You got to remember now, water came from up under the ground. Under the ground. I guarantee you, he didn't expect that. And sometimes when you're following your heart, you got to be willing to wait for the mist to show up. Situation and circumstances. Like, girl, you're going to never believe what happened to me. That was some mist. Now, it ain't rain, but it's mist to get you going. It's mist at times to, 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 to restore you. It's mist to encourage you to go forward. Two, though it's just mist and not rain, it seems insignificant, but it's making something of you. It seems insignificant, but it's making something of you. Three, I told you last week, it is also making you whole. Because it says it watered the whole ground. Whole, which means lacking nothing. God don't want to lack nothing. Physically, financially, marriagely, socially, spiritually, he don't want us lacking nothing. Four, it will reveal some cracks you have. In order for the mist to show up, it got to reveal some cracks. Five, I told you, trust the process. Trust the process. And then and six, uh, the mist is part of God's formation. Because without the mist, without the mist, he couldn't form man. So the mist is part of man being formed. The mist is part of you becoming what God has called you to be. Now let's move to the new stuff. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Remember, he couldn't form man out of the dust unless he sent the mist. So the mist was part of him. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a uh, living being. Let's look at the word. And the Lord God formed man. He didn't make man, he formed man. The, the definition of formed means to fashion, to produce, create, or another word I put in there, I didn't put it up there, but design. He formed, which means he fashioned, produced, create, or designed man. He formed him. Jeremiah 29 and 11, while you guys are writing the definition of form, let's look at Jeremiah 29 and 11. Let's look at Jeremiah 29 and 11. And look what the Lord says. And he wasn't just talking to one man. He was talking to all of us. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. The New King James, the, the NIV says, for I know the plans. The plans that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now watch this. It's very important. I, I got to point this out here. For I know the thoughts. In other words, he's always thinking about you. Hard as it may be, uh, believe, it, he's always thinking about you. The thoughts I have. He says for towards you, to the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. I used to think a long time ago, when you, you know, when you do something bad, God going to whoop you. No, he, 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 he said the thoughts I think of you is toward peace. So I'm trying to make sure I put some things in life that brings you the sound mind, brings the calmness, the, um, the humbleness at the end of the day. So God is not one of these punishers or he's bringing evil. I know the Lord is whooping me. Well, if you know he's whooping you, I suggest you stop doing whatever you're doing. And if, you, if, you, if you're that smart. So I don't think he's that type of God. God is just a, I would tell somebody the other day, that anything that um, everybody should know is, 
If, if God is good all the time and all the time God is good, that's enough to hold anybody. You don't even have to know no scripture in the Bible at all. If you just knew that and lived that and thought that and spoke that all day, every day, I believe your life would just go well. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. That's it. Because I know he thinks towards me. He has plans for me. So he's just good. He doesn't do good. He just is good. By him being good, everything he does is good. That's it. That's your daddy. That's your dad. That's the kind of father that he has. Plans for you. So he had plans for Adam. We we're all supposed to have been born in the Eden. We're going to talk about that. The Garden of Eden. We were all supposed to be born there. When Adam messed up and disobeyed God, God put him out. When he put him out, he put us out. Now, at the end of the day, we were all supposed to be there. Now, when we get down here to the garden, we'll be on in the 3.0, you will see the purpose that you can still have that heaven on earth. That's what God intended for all of us. So, the word form. Write these four characteristics down. One... It says, he formed man out of the dust of the ground. Can we go back to Genesis 2 and 7? Can we go back there real quick? Look at it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Of the dust of the ground. So man is ground. So in other words, that which God created um, Adam out of, he was that. So one, whatever God has for you, you were created for it. Write that down. You were created for it. You were created for it. He made man out of the very thing he wanted him to rule over. Two, you were equipped with the accessories to solve the problem. You were equipped with the accessories to solve the problem. Adam had everything he needed to do the job that he was called to do. You have everything you need to do the job that God has called you to do. You got everything you need. Three, it's part of who you are. Not only was the garden made of dirt, not only is the earth made of dirt, but Adam too was made of dirt. So the very thing that, remember that he was given authority over, he's part of. Remember I told you last week, you cannot rule anything you have not been given authority over. And four, you are one with it. Kind of like my job. I think about it all day, every day. I could be on vacation, I'm thinking about it. I could be eating in a restaurant, I'm thinking about it. I could see someone driving somewhere and see something, I'm thinking about it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's always on my mind. never leaves me because I'm one with it. I'm one with it. It's not a day yet in, ten, in ten years have I ever said, I'm sick and tired of this. Nah. Now I've had some bad days. And that just kind of with living. But not when it comes to purpose. I'll get rid of anything and everybody, but I ain't get rid of purpose. Getting rid of my purpose is getting rid of my life. And I've already become one with it. So it says at the end of the day that, um, you go back to Genesis 2, if you will. Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed man the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The definition of breath, let's talk about breath. The word breath in Greek is pneumo. Pneuma, sorry, pneuma. Almost where we get pneumonia from. Which simply means breeze, wind, current of air. A current of air. So man, so God blew the breath of life into man. The breath of life into man. Let's, let's look at um, John 6, 63. John 6 and 63. Give you a chance to write that down and then give you time to turn to it. John 6, 63. So God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life. We just found out that, that the breath means breeze or wind or the current of air. John 6, 63 says, it is the spirit who gives what? Life. So when God blew into Adam, he blew in his spirit. Because it's the spirit that gives life. God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. So it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So it's very important you, you get this at the end of the day. Write this down. I don't think I gave it to the man in the back. Write this down. The spirit carries the divine plan. 
That's why we need the Holy Spirit. I used to think a long time ago, um, the Holy Spirit was all about uh, jumping, howling, and shouting, and running. It has nothing to do with that. The Holy Spirit carries out the divine plan of God. So when God said, I got another plan that I have for you, plans that will prosper you and not harm you. Well, who knows the plan? The Holy Spirit does. Remember Jesus said in John, the Holy Spirit would not speak on his own authority, but he will only tell you what he what? He is. He is what? The divine plan. Remember, eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard, nor have he entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those whom he loved. But, God has revealed it to them by his what? Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the plan. So that's why we're like, Lord, send your Holy Spirit. We need it. He got the plan. But it had nothing to do with all that hollering, shuffling, and jolling, and falling on the floor. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that after he told you what? The plan. Then, yeah, you can do what you want to do. Then you say, girl, I know what I'm going to do. First of all, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to save my money and do this here. I'm going to do this here. I'm going to register for this class. I'm going to go get my DBA. Or I'm going to, as soon as I get home, I'm putting Tyrone out. <laughs> Whatever it is, I, I, the Holy Spirit gave me the divine plan. So the Holy Spirit carries the divine plan. Write this down. And God's thoughts. Remember, Jesus, remember Paul says, no man knows the mind of God but the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God because God is what? Spirit. It just makes sense. So it had nothing to do with all that religion. Maybe not you, but whatever I grew up with, it's like, man, that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. So I need the Holy Spirit. All day, every day. He knows. So the Holy Spirit carries the divine plan and God's thoughts. Projecting into our mind ideas. Hear what I mean? You ever been sitting somewhere and think about something, and all of a sudden, whoosh, it just dropped right to you, like, guess what I'm on? Like, where did you get that from? Like, I don't know. I just, it just was a good idea. That's what I'm talking about. You connected right then and there with God, Holy Spirit. Because remember now, all his ways are perfect. Like, oh, that was a good idea. That's going to work. You think it's going to work? Girl, I know that's going to work. Connected to him. Connected to him. Yeah. So he projected it into our minds and ideas that builds Spiritual consciences. And when old folks say, you know what? I don't want to do nothing right now. Let me pray about it. See what God has to say. Right. They said, I'm trying to connect with that spiritual mind. Young folks, all of them, I'm trying to hear all that right out there. Bam, get your head tore off. No, that's, you should have waited. Oh, yeah, they know. Pray, 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 pray. If they only knew. Back then, even myself, I probably wish I knew then what I know now. Before I do anything, before I sign my name, before I commit to anything or anybody, then let me pray about you. Let me, mm, I can't get, what you, I can't eat my word. Let me see what God got to say, because he knows the divine plan. Look at your neighbor and say, pray about it. The reason you're praying about it because you need the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Speak, speak to it about this. Speak to it about them. Speak to it about it. Speak. Right sign the paper. Go ahead and sign right here. No, I don't feel, somebody I don't feel comfortable for doing this here. Yeah, that's God warning you right then. He ain't right. You ain't right. So that, that, that's, where, that's where we at. Um, I added this. I added this. The bag doesn't have it. So I apologize for anybody who doesn't have your Bible right now. But notice what it says here. It's very important. I, I read this to you. Watch this. It says in uh, 2 and 7. And the Lord God breathed for, uh, uh, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So the breath of life, that wind, that current. That air, he breathed into him, which I tell you, I want you to write this down. Without the Holy Spirit, man can never get his inspiration. Because, watch this, the word inspiration simply means in Latin, inspired. Take the inspired, and then it says, the Spirit in. That's why we, once again, that's why we need the Holy Spirit. I used to think it's all religion. Oh, Holy Spirit. It's like, oh my God, when are they going to finish? Now I'm like, oh no. I'm thinking about the Holy Spirit in my car, in my, in my office, in the restroom. I'm thinking about him all. I need the Holy Spirit to speak to me. And what he does is he inspires me. That's why when we come to the house of God, the house of worship, the house of prayer, the house of sacrifice, and we get a word from God, oh, I'm on fire. You've been inspired. Technically, all you got was the Holy Spirit. 
That's what you got. You got the spirit because the word is anointed. Are you with me? Right. So that's why we need the word because the word is inspired by it. And here's why we, why we need the word. Again, I didn't give it to him in the back, so don't worry about it. But write this down for those who have your, 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 your pen and pad. 2 Timothy 3. I just want to show you. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. I'll read it. You don't have to turn there because it's going to be very quick and we'll get back to it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God or the breath of God or the spirit of God. Watch this. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17. That the man of God, a man being male or female, a man being the species, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's why we need the word of God because it inspires man by the spirit of God to get out, do work, till, till, the till is full. Now he got purpose. Now he is complete, whole, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, get back to Genesis 2 and 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Man became. So without us being led or having a relationship through the Holy Spirit, we cannot become what we call to be. In other words, you can't do it without God. I'm going to do it myself. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. It was only until God breathed his spirit into man, then man became what he intended man to be. I don't know. I don't know my purpose in life. You need to give the Holy Ghost then. He know your plan. I don't know your plan. He know your plan. Remember, he said, I knew you before you were even formed in your mother. I had plans for you. I thought about years ago. I said, okay, who would know where the treasure is unless it's the one who buried the treasure? Look at your neighbor and say, he knows. He knows. Everybody who lost, I don't know what my life going to be like. Go, go to God. Like real talk, go to God. He knows. He knows. So write this down. So man became a living being. Write this down. The word became. One, something he was intended to be. Is what he was intended to be. And once again, it goes back to purpose. Two, he became a living being. Two, write this down. Living is a state of. It's a state of. It didn't say he had a Benz. It didn't say he had a 6,000 square foot house. It didn't say any of that. What it said at the end of the day that what he was created to do, he was doing it. By him doing what he was created to do, I believe he had everything. He had everything. He had everything. And I'm going to prove it to you in a minute how he had everything. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute where he had everything. All right, let's move on. Genesis 2 and 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. He put the man whom he had formed. I, I went back and, and studied the, the word Eden. I, I studied the Garden of Eden. I went back and studied the Garden of Eden. Just in a little small text of Genesis 2 and 8. And I want you to write a couple things down. One, the Garden of Eden. Write this, write this down real quickly. The word garden in Hebrew means gan, G-A-N. Garden means gan in Hebrew, G-A-N, which means an organized place of activity. It's an organized place of activity. It could be a body, a world, a garden, or a universe. Again, garden is, in Hebrew means gan, G-A-N means an organized place of activity. And you all seen a garden. If you got a big mama or auntie, whomever, or aunt, or whoever go over there. Baby, watch where you step. That's my garden right there. There are my greens right there. There are my bell peppers right there. And it's all organized. It is. It ain't just no stuff up in now. It's organized. We're going to get to that. Because that, what that tells me is that God placed this man in an organized situation. 
God is not the author of what? Confusion. You will know if he got you in the right job. You know if he got you in the right house. You know if he got you in the right relationship. Because there is order. You cry all the night. You at the altar. Oh, no. They ain't no garden. That don't sound like paradise to me. That's all I'm saying. I mean, look for yourself. It just makes sense. You ain't seen no, ever mean seen no messy garden before. I don't care who owned it. So we place the man in an organized situation. Uh, two, write this down. Eden. Eden in Hebrew means he den. H E D E N. Which means a time, a season, an age, and beauty. Eden means. A time, a season, an age, or beauty. So watch this. So technically, watch this. Remember, I told you just a minute ago that became simply means a state of. Remember, I just said that a minute ago? Pastor just said a minute ago? Watch this. So that means the God on of Eden, which God on means a place of, uh, of organized activity, right? And I just told you, it, it, uh, Eden, which means a time, a season, an age, or beauty. So you put the garden of Eden in it, and what that means is in day that God placed him in a state of bliss. It was, how y'all doing? How, how you and Craig doing? We doing good. What you saying is everything is organized. He, I'm getting what I need. He getting what he need. We paying bills. We saving money. We going on a trip next month in the summertime. Life is good. You are well in a state of bliss. Now, Haley gonna say, girl, it ain't all that. Now, I know they ain't Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. I am what's called joyful. Yes. Happy is temporary. Yeah. Joy ain't. Yeah. Come on. So I didn't know right to be this good. <laughs> See, something to me, you in the Garden of Eden. You in your paradise. That's really what it means. And we're gonna only show you later how it was intended for all of us. To be in paradise, like I am so joyful. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. All right. So, so let me go back to an eight. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. You're gonna love this. He planted a garden eastward in Eden. Watch this. Watch this. Write this down. The eco. E-C-O. Eco. Eco means habitat or connected with the environment. Eco means habitat or connected with the environment. Believe it or not, the eco also in Greek means okos. O-I-K-O-S. I think they got some actually yogurt named that okos. Yeah. Which means house. House or a connotation of earth. House. You know, the, uh, it, it's said that we live in this earth suit. We're in this spiritual house. Are you with me? Because God dwells in a house that's not made with hands. Are you with me? All right, praise God. Because all this stuff makes sense, I'm telling you. It makes sense. All right, so the eco is the habitat or connected with environment. Habitat are connected with the environment. Got it. Now watch this. Logi, L-O-G-Y. Well, you can get ecology, but I'm going to break it down. down. Logi, L-O-G-Y, which means knowledge. All right. So if, 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 if eco means habitat or connected with the environment, logi, L-O-G-Y, means knowledge, then ecology, E-C-O-L-O-G-Y, you can write it all together, and that means the knowledge, being knowledgeable of the environment. That's all it means. Ecology is the knowledgeable of the environment. Remember now, God placed him in the environment. It's going to mean something in a minute. Well, I was already on eco and in ecology. I think I might well go ahead and go with the ecosystem. So, watch this. Well, they know what eco means. The ecosystem is a community made up of living and non-living organisms. Watch this. 
that share an environment and have a role. It's an, e it's an ecosystem. It's a community, a community something that's structured, made up of living and non-living organisms that share an environment and have a role. That's the ecosystem. Nomics, N-O-M-I-C-S, you've seen that before. Nomics means management and the measure of. Management, which is structure, management and measurement of. Management and measurement of is what nomics mean. N-O-M-I-C-S. You already know what eco means. Eco means, again, the habitat or connected with the environment. So if nomics is measurement, management and measurement of, eco is the habitat and connected with the environment, right? So economics is no more than the management and measurement of the environment. That's all it is. I don't understand economics. Well, it's no more than the management and the measurement of your environment. Or your household. Do you not know your household is economics? <laughs> it's economics. And it's basic economics. Now watch this. Write this down. Three things I'm going to have you write down. One, economics is simply what you bring to the marketplace. Economics is what you bring to the marketplace. That's all simple economics is, what you bring to the marketplace. Remember now, God had not caused the rain because there was no man to do what? To the ground. That man was created for that purpose. That man is bringing something well to the marketplace. Ain't nobody hiring. No, ain't nobody hiring you because you ain't bringing nothing to the marketplace. I'm just being 100 with you. Don't care what job you at. Oh, no. All they pay everybody around here is $20 an hour. That's all they pay you. And somebody else, I'm sure they pay way more than that. Why are they paying that person more than you? Because that person bring what? More to the marketplace. Bring more. Look at your neighbor and say, bring more. Bring more. That's why you learn a certain skill. You learn another skill. That's why you go ahead and get another degree. That's why you do this and that. Because you're trying to bring what? Bring more. Bring Man, say, well, right now, I'll pay you, you know, $20 an hour. But if you had your bachelor's, I'll pay you 30 I'm about to go get more. <laughs> you hear me? Well, yeah, I'll pay you 30 now. But if you had your master's, I'll pay you 40 Go get. He said, you bring me more, you get more. You get more. More people don't make enough because they don't bring enough. That's all. They don't bring enough. Two, bringing a product or service, but more importantly, the process builds you. In other words, in other words what, are you saying? what are you saying, Pastor? Yeah, so that person went out and got a bachelor's degree. So that person went out and got a master's degree. Got it. They got that. But the most important thing in the day is what all that stuff built them to be. It's what they became. Remember? Man became a living being. It's what you become. Here's why. Whatever that job paying you $30 an hour, $40 an hour, let's be 100. You can lose that. Here's what you won't lose. What you became. Because watch this, baby. If they pay me over here, oh, they'll pay me over here. If they don't watch it, boo-boo, I'll take all my skills and start my own thing and be their competitor. Yeah. It won't be long. I'll pray to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will send the people to my life. You know what? You know what you want to do? What? Girl, if I was you, I'd start my own business. I wouldn't be letting them make all this money for them. You say, I hear you, God. If two more people come in agreement with them, I'm about to bust a move. <laughs> really? See, it's what you became. The degree is fine, but the degree at the end of the day is going to get you a job. What you become gets you a life. You can lose your job. Don't lose your life. Jesus said, I came that you might have what? Life. That's when you own it, baby. I got my life. I can take my life to Chicago, California, New York. I'm not limited to what these people are doing around here. All I'm going to do is change my environment because I know what I bring where? To the marketplace, boo. <laughs> I know what I bring, baby. I won't be an employer for long. You got to know this. Three, write this down. You should want to become rich or a millionaire for what you become in the process. You should want to become that. 
I had all the millionaires say something like this. I was a millionaire and I lost all my money. Then I made it back again. It was based on what they become. They didn't go get a job. They said, what I already know, I'm going to put it to work. I listened to, 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 to some financial uh, um, analysts on a particular television business show. And they said, if they took all the money in the world from all the rich people and dispersed it to everybody in the world, it's a matter of time. Them same people will have that money right back to them. Here's why, ladies and gentlemen. It makes so much sense. It's like, oh, well, and I hear people say all the time, well, you know, the rich are start helping other people. Oh, uh, no. All the people are start helping themselves become something. Are you with me? I'm just being 100. See, the reason money is going to come back because the people have become a magnet. They put it out there, man, it's going to draw right back to them because they attracted. The other people that we just gave money to, they're going to go broke anyway. They don't know what to do with it. Here's why. They hadn't become. They hadn't become nothing. They just got money. So now I'm not, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, there it is. Nobody's hungry to be taught. Nobody wants to become. Just give me, give me, give me. No, I need you to become so you can take what you became and put it in the marketplace. And the, the market will give you what you want. The market will give it to you. The market will give it to you. So, the Lord God planted a, a, a garden eastward in the Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Now watch this. Well, you're going to love this. Oh, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you're going to love this. Genesis 2 and 5. For those who got your Bible, go back there. If we got that scripture for last week, you're going to love it. And then pastor's done. Genesis 2 and 5. Genesis 2 and 5. You're going to love this. Remember now, so, so Genesis 2 and 8 says, God uh, formed man whom he had formed, planted a garden eastward, and he put the man in Eden. Watch this. Genesis 2 and 5 says, Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused the rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. Before anything had grown, God had not caused the rain on the earth, because why? There was no man to till the ground. Write this down. Nothing can grow without the right environment. Nothing can grow without the right environment. I don't care how hard you want it to happen. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you wish. No. Nothing can grow without the right environment. Now, Genesis 2 and 5, they can pop it up there and find it from last week. Nothing had grown because there was no man to till the ground. Once man got there, God created the Eden. Now he placed man in the right environment. Because man now can till the ground. Once man starts tilling, things will start to what? Grow. Mm. Write this down. Not only nothing can grow without the right environment. Nothing can grow until it's tilled. Who tilling you? Who tilling you? Who holding you accountable? Who hold you responsible? Yeah, girl, you said you were going to do that last month. You still ain't done it. Girl, I know. Now, who holding you? Who telling you? Come on now. Wait, girl, where you at? It's 7 o'clock. Why you ain't in school? Why you ain't at church? Who telling you? Remember that nothing grown without you getting tilled. Who telling you? Who telling you? Nothing grows. Who's your mentor? Who's your teacher? Who is that person for you? You got to have that person. I know. I said I was going to stop doing that. That person going to hold you till. That person going to keep tilling you till. Come on now. I don't care what it is. You say, come on now. You say you're going to get your degree. What you taking off for summer for? What, what you going to do? You had all summers off. You don't have time to take summers off. That, that person tilling you. That person trying to make sure you grow. That person got purpose. Adam had purpose. Remember, I told you that the teal and the mist will show you cracks. The people are always playing. You ain't never got nothing good to say. Baby, I ain't here to be your friend. I got purpose. I'm not here to be your friend. I got purpose. Three, 
Nothing can grow without structure. Nothing can grow without the structure. Let me see your schedule. What, what, what are you doing? What, 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 I don't have time to go. Now, let me see your schedule. You understand? I, I'm a mom with two kids. Let me see your schedule, girl. Okay, here and here. Okay, you're wasting time right here. You can drop them kids off of your mama's house. You got time. <laughs> they, they'll find structure. You know, you ain't got like structure. A rich man and a poor man get the same amount of time. 24 hours, Jack. A rich man can't buy no more time. Somehow or another, he's making good with his time. Write this down. Nothing can grow without discipline. So you got the structure. I know I, I read the regimen. You say do this every day. Yeah, but you ain't doing it. Where's your discipline? Next, nothing can grow without nourishment. Nothing can grow without nourishment. Even with plants and, and all that, you got to still give it food. Oh, it, oh right there, nourishment. Sweetheart, before I sound all pleasantry right now, put in, put in, put in parentheses where nourishment is, put fertilizer. Because <laughs> some of y'all don't like to take it. <laughs> yeah, you got to take some. That's how some things what? Grow. I'm sick of this. No, 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 fine purpose in that. That's going to make you better for when you're about to go somewhere. Well, they ain't treat me right. Well, good. You appreciate the people when they do. The good ones come and treat you right. You appreciate all that. It's making you grow. Oh, I would say something. Now I'm learning to break my tongue. So you're already growing already. <laughs> you're growing. You're going to need some fertilizer. You're going to need some cow chips. <laughs> you're going to need it. You're going to need it. It's part of the process. Nothing can grow. Write this down without the right people being in the right place. Nothing grew until God put Adam in the right place. And nothing was going to grow on the earth until Adam showed up. Nothing can grow without people being filled with purpose. Nothing can grow without people being purpose. People who got purpose won't, won't let nothing die. <laughs> nothing died when they put that man in the scene. The Bible said nothing died. Nothing dies. Watch this. When we got the Holy Ghost inside of us, the Holy Spirit, nothing dies. We'll be filled with life. We'll be filled with purpose. And lastly, nothing can grow without people caring about the environment. That boy cared about his environment. That care about your environment. Your area, your community. You got to care about it. Write these, write these uh, four points down and pass it done. Write these four points down on this exceptional life. One, Learn to speak the language of the environment to trade. Do you not know I won't go there tonight? Do you not know the Bible says God brought everything to Adam and who named it? Adam did. It was me. Adam spoke the language. What, what, what are you saying, Pastor? Let me give you a simple analogy. Let's say uh, you decide to put a soul food restaurant somewhere. You better put that well in the right environment. I'm going to put it over there about the three, four hundred thousand dollar homes is. Girl, you're going to be out of business. <laughs> I don't care how you think God led you, you not. You better go where them 80 and 90 thousand dollar homes is. That's where you better go. And when you go over there, don't be, um, table for two, please. Uh, what? You better, you better be like, like, hey, sit wherever y'all want to. We'll be right there in a minute. Yeah, they you to that. Yeah, I'll be the language. Are you with me? Oh, I'm just saying. Understand, know your environment. I'm about to open up a car dealership. I'm telling you, I'm, not, I'm, I'm fooling. I'm just having them a bad pass on my, on my lot. I'm having them a Benz and Lexus and Jag. You better not put it over there by that soul food restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand the environment. Understand the environment. Now, what you do better do is get rid of them Lexus and, and, and all them Jags and all that and get you some 49, 49, 4995 cars. Those are going to sell. <laughs> $5,000 less cars, that's going to sell. Put it right next to the soul food restaurant. That's a person who understands what? Damn. That's what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen. Speak the language of the environment. You got to trade with them. You got to trade with the environment. Adam was trading for the environment. What's in the name of Jesus? Adam was trading with the environment. Watch this. Adam brought purpose. He tilled, right? 
So he tilled the ground, gave what the ground gave him. Apples, oranges, tomatoes, tomatoes, yep. <laughs> beans, greens. You with me though? He traded with the environment. The environment what? Traded back. Woohoo! That's the economy. That man was running. That's what God intended for all of us. Two, learn more than one skill to trade in the marketplace. Learn more than one skill. The Bible says in Matthew 25, the pepper of talent, he gave one man, gave one man five, he took them five in a five more. Gave one man two, he took them two in a two more. Gave one man one, that man didn't do nothing with it. But he would have got another skill. He would have got another trade. He would have gotten something else to trade with who? The marketplace. The market wants to trade. God, how they get rich? Because they have something to trade. Three. What you become pays more than what you bring. What you become pays more than what you bring. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying again, though you're making thirty, forty dollars an hour, right? That's the talent that you bring. But they can always lay you off. They can always fire you. But what you become, baby, you can take that and make money anywhere. So we gotta be excited about what we're becoming. Look at your neighbor and say, "I'm becoming. I'm becoming. I'm, I'm becoming." I'm becoming. And when I start becoming, and when I focus on just being, things just start coming. Things start coming, because I'm living my purpose now. I become now that magnet. And that's why I left this last piece for you. Four. Success is something you attract by becoming attractive. It's nothing you pursue. My God, that thing just come to you. They do. They do. So it's what you become by becoming attractive. By you becoming attractive. That's what God has for us all. So that's all I got for you tonight on the Living Exceptional Life 2.0. Can we get a Lord a big hand and clap of praise?